Hi, I'm Mylene Roach, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to talk all about needles. Well, like, what's the point, right? And I didn't put this in our announcement, but we're gonna, I'm gonna have Deborah Jones join me today, and that's gonna be great because she really knows, you know, the point of all the needles. So let's go ahead and welcome in uh, Deborah right now. While well, you all sign in. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Eileen. Thank you for joining me today. You are, you know, just a wealth of information, and I'm, you know, I feel like you're at my rescue when you come. So thank you. Uh, not, not at all, Eileen. You are a real expert, but it's fun to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I love about Deborah Jones. If you don't know Deborah, she has a, a vast experience in the embroidery industry on the commercial side and also on the home sew side. So she really blends those two together. But maybe the best thing about Deborah is she puts a lot of this techno jargon that confuses many of us into common sense terms. She's kind of a calming effect in your studio. I always keep her close at heart and in mind, right Deborah? Thanks Eileen, yeah, no, nope. I, I try to make it logical. Absolutely. And we have folks from joining uh, from all over. Retha Ranke from Wyoming and Judy Warren is saying aloha. And <laughs> Stephanie Hardy, how nice. Yeah, we get two wonderfully talented people. Thank you for your kind words, for sure. For sure. And Linda Burke, you have a, um, a little crush on Deborah, right? Deborah is wonderful. I feel the same way, for sure. I know you know Linda, right? Yes. Yeah. So many of these names are familiar to us. We're so blessed that this is a tight community. You know, many of us, many of you have been stitching together for years. And there's Diane Mullins Atkinson. Hi, Diane. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, so, Deborah, we do have a PowerPoint to show. So I guess we can go ahead and get started on that. But before we do, look who else is in the house. That's Joanne Banco. So Let's Go Sew with Joanne Banco. If you don't know Joanne, you can find her at letsgosew.com. She's a wealth of embroidery and sewing information. Okay, so Deborah, the needles, the do's and do's and don'ts of ne needles. I remember I, I remember the do's and don'ts in Glamour magazine when I was a teenager. Do you remember that? <laughs> the dressing do's and don'ts. Yes, definitely. And that, that title has just stuck with me forever. It's a great way to title almost any topic that you're talking about, what to do and what not to do. And, you know, I think if we went back now, I'm getting off topic, but if we went back to those glamour columns, you know, in the seventies and eighties and everything that we said, don't do then we're actually wearing now. <laughs> that, that's right. You know, we've got exposed lingerie and everything else. I know that's the truth. Okay. So what, there's so many different, well, you could talk about needles for probably an hour, but we won't do that, but we will talk about, we'll start with the blade side blade size, excuse me. So Deborah, talk to us about these um, points, would you please? Sure, sure, absolutely. You know, the, the smallest embroidery uh, needle blade is the 65.9 and that's a very light blade. And for that reason, we don't use our automatic threaders with this because it could get them out of adjustment. We don't want to do that. So we're not going to use this needle type frequently, but you know, when we do, uh, don't use the auto threader. The 7511 is, of course, the one that all of us know and use 90% of the time, probably, because it's used for a wide range of fabrics and thread types. And then, of course, the 8513 moves up the scale to uh, the heavier fabrics like denims and items that are made with heavier yarns. And, you know, even when you're stitching with a heavier thread, the 8513 could be a good choice. And then the 9014 is the heaviest embroidery blade that we have available for our machines in uh, with the flat shank needle. And that's good for caps, webbing, canvas, and embroidery over seams. It's kind of heavy. You don't want to use it unless you really need to. That's why we love the 8513 because it's a step below that. So unless you you know, are doing something super heavy, don't go to the 9014. But when you need it, we're going to show you why you might need it in just a, in just a moment on a future slide. Yeah. 
Deborah, I thought I would just pipe in and share Janine Mesler's comment. She said she loves our dime needles. They're the only ones she uses and they make her machine very happy. Well, you know what? There's a reason for that. And you know, Eileen, this isn't even in our presentation, but you know, I'm glad Janine made that comment because Janine, you know, the reason your machine loves this is the reason the technicians tell us that they are superior needles because our needles have an a extra long eye, even for an embroidery needle. And that's good not only for the multi-needle machines, but also for your single needles. So the threaders love them. The machines love them. They really uh, make a great stitch formation. That longer eye is absolutely the best. And that's why your machine loves it. Awesome. Well, and Risa, she's confessing that she's been using the 90 to 14 all the time. Well, you know, don't, don't, don't worry. Don't, yeah, don't wor no worries. But, but Risa, you know, the, 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 9014 has the largest footprint, if you think about it. So it's making the larger holes. So if you can back off of that a little bit, you know, your fabric might be a little happier. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then Diana Mullen Atkinson, she wants to know, is there a distinct difference between the 8012 and the 8513? Well, there is a distinct difference between all of those needle sizes, even though they only step up by that, that five points. But, but, you know, I prefer an 8513 when I'm working with a heavier fabric because it does keep me from making that jump up to the 90. But there are times when you need the 90 because we want to avoid uh, that needle getting pushed aside, which could be damaging to a machine. So there are times when you want the 90, they all serve their purpose. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that was going to do that. But let's talk about the groove because this is pretty integral too. Yes. And the groove is that trough on the front of the needle that guides the thread to the eye. And that's why you use a finer blade needle with the uh, finer threads, because if you use the, hev the heavier needle, that groove is too big and it's sloppy. It doesn't guide the thread uh, precisely down to the eye. So if you're using a 60 weight thread, you will get no benefit or very little benefit if you're using a size 85 needle because it that groove is so wide, it's letting the thread wiggle around in there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It sure does. And you know, Janine made another comment that's pretty interesting. Uh, she says, believe it or not, I use your 65-9 needle when embroidery faux leather. No large holes, and it works beautifully every time. That's now, this is a wise woman. And, you know, the, the type of needle for leather really depends on the leather or the faux leather itself. Because if it's fragile or thin or lightweight, mm -hmm. absolutely. The smallest needle footprint you can make, the better. And, you know, Janine, I'd be interested in you commenting again and tell us if you're using uh, the ballpoint. Because uh, I'm guessing you're using a ballpoint, but with really fragile leather, you could use a sharp. So. Uh, let us know which point type you're using as well. Awesome. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide, right, you Deborah? Bet, you bet. Because this is what I was mentioning why you might need a 90 sometimes, because that uh, stitching over a seam or something like that could cause deflection. And you see this picture shows you what deflection means. And if that needle is deflected over to the, uh, it might strike the side of your needle hole the, uh, and, or it could strike your sewing hook. It, you don't want it hitting metal. And so anything that it strikes could cause a burr, which could lead to thread breaks that are uh, mysterious. <laughs> and so we don't want, that's why you need to use the correct size blade. By the way, it, in case you're wondering, if in the size 7511 or 8513, the first number is the American system. It was named by Singer. And the second number is what they, designate needles by in Europe. So you can use them together. You can use them separately. They mean the same thing. But just remember the larger number is the heavier blade. So the 65 is the small on the smaller end, the 90s on the heavier end. 
Right. Well, you know, you had asked Janine to comment again about um, if she uses a yes. sharp or a ballpoint. And uh -huh. so she says that she actually uses the, the sharp. Okay. Well, great. Well, you know, really, Janine, uh, you are making the smallest penetration as you as you know as you stated in your faux leather so that's fantastic because the smaller the hole in in a material like that um certainly the better great good thanks for letting us know absolutely what works for you because you know all of these things are i always say eileen you can't argue with the results right yeah it's very true you can't argue with the results yep okay so when you get the tiny text, that's really when it calls for a very light blade, right? Right. Tiny text is what's on this handkerchief. And that's another point I want to make about the needles. And that is that not only is this tiny text, but it's also that handkerchief is a fine, delicate fabric. So you would not want to be using a, any larger needle than necessary because we're trying to make the smallest needle penetration as possible. So the light blade is good for delicate fabrics and smaller thread sizes. So match up that size 60 weight thread with either a 65 or a 70. Uh, as I said, the wide groove in a bigger blade needle does not control that thread because you're guiding the thread down to the eye, Eileen. That's right. And that really fine thread will just wiggle all over the place. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Oh, and look, Diana Mullins Atkinson, she <clears throat> confirms that that 65.9 and 60 weight thread combo was really a game changer for her lettering. I, I agree. It really is a game changer. You know, sometimes when you change needles, you may not see that big of a difference, but on lettering, oh, it is glaring, right, Deborah? Right, and that ribbon that you see there, that is a three-eighths inch grow grain ribbon with quarter inch lettering on it. So you know that if you can do uh, that size on grow grain, you're going to get the clarity on whatever you're embroidering. Absolutely. Beautifully stitched. I love that on grow grain. Now you're talking heavier blades here in these examples, right? Right. So that uh, 8513 or 9014 would absolutely be appropriate for uh, canvas bags, webbing, for caps. So these are times that you do want the heavier needle and they're going to protect your, your machine because Honestly, a 7511 on these fabrics really could become deflected, even though that's what we tend to use most of the time. Everybody does. But this is when we need to uh, be sure we're not getting that needle pushed aside. Okay, great. So Wendy has asked a question about um, piecing, quilting, and embroidery. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit, Wendy. So stay tuned. Right. Because that is definitely a hot topic today for sure. It is. And, you know, mm -hmm. interestingly, not only do embroidery needles have a bigger eye, and this shows that really elongated eye uh, in in a, a embroidery needle like uh, the dime needles, but it also has a wider front groove so than a sewing needle. Then the, if you had a size 7511 sewing needle and the same needle, but with an embroidery system, we call it, the, uh, the groove is wider. And so that's just the, one of the differences in the two systems. And the eye is extremely smooth and rounded uh, for the unrestricted flow of the thread. So that means with an embroidery needle, you're going to have less friction. And of course, having less friction is going to create smoother sewing, less thread breaks. That's why uh, the, the uh, viewer who commented that, uh, I think it was Janine, that her machine loves this needle. It's because that it, that's a perception based on the fact that sh it runs trouble free. And it, right. it's doing that because of that extra long eye. Right. And, you know, she said her machine likes that needle, but it might really be the fabric that likes that needle. <laughs> yeah, it's probably both. It's probably right? both. Yes. But, um, let's see. Joanne Banco says that even when she's sewing, which she does an awful lot of, she uses the smallest workable needle for the fabric as well, because like she says, small holes make better stitches. I yeah. agree. 
Yes. And, you know, a neater look, just a neater overall look, because even though we tend to view our embroidery at a distance, when you look at it closely, you can see those larger needle holes, right, Eileen? Yeah. Oh, you sure can. You sure can. And, you know, Retha, our friend up in Wyoming, just said that she just checked the embroiderer's compass, which you wrote, devised, wrote, <laughs> created, invented, whatever you want to call that. And that it does show the needle size. She had never noticed that before. Right. Well, I'm glad you noticed it now. And I do give you choices, Retha, as you can see. So I don't just limit you to one size or one type uh, in a lot of cases, just the same as with the stabilizers, because, you know, often you can go a little bit one direction or the other. And you can be the best judge of that because you're the one looking at your fabric and your project there. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So here's the, uh, the difference between that is a major difference that a lot of times we overlook with embroidery. We think about it when we're sewing, maybe not as much when we're embroidering, but embroidery needles tend to be light ballpoint. When you go to the store and buy embroidery needles, a lot of times you're buying a light ballpoint. And then it's a good needle because they won't damage knits, but they do not penetrate woven fabrics as cleanly as a sharp needle. Sharp needles, remember, have that smaller footprint and they slide more easily into woven fabrics. Now, if you look at these illustrations, they are very good ones to show the difference between a ballpoint and a sharp. There's really no ball on the point. It's just yeah. a blunter point, right, Eileen? Absolutely. It's just rounded instead of pointed. Right. That's right. It's not, it's not that it's not sharp. It is sharp, of course, but it's, it's a, it's a larger point. That's the, that's the difference. Right. Yeah. Um, so J here's another new comment from Janine. Yeah. And so she says that that 65 needle works for designs that have small intricate details, not just text, which some designs have, you know, delicate little outlines, small, tight running stitches, and that is a good use for the 65.9. And Sandra Lee says that she also reduces the top tension on lightweight fabrics. Do you do that, Deborah, on your machine? Oh, yes. That's a great tip, Sandra. You know, mm -hmm. that is really helpful to also, you know, when you're using that smaller needle, you're reducing the stress on the fabric. And when you're working with those kind of fabrics, you are reducing the stress when you lighten up that tension as well. Good, good to, good to have that uh, tip shared. Very good, Sandra. Right. And another one of our uh, good friends, Reen Wilcoxon, is in the house. It's so nice to have everybody here today. And she also confirms that that 65.9 is great for lettering, for sure. That micro lettering with the 60 weight thread, that's really the winning combination, right, Deborah? Well, I think most people would be amazed once they try it because yeah. it, is, it is really the, the mm -hmm. silver bullet. Now, the ballpoint needles, We look at this illustration. I love this, il this image because if you look at the interlocking structure of a knit, you can see that the purpose of a ballpoint is just to spread that yarn apart, not to pierce it. So you don't want to cut one of those interlocking yarns because that could cause it to uh, become, it could damage the structural integrity if you want to think of it that way, because yeah. that could just start to ravel away through laundering and uh, usage of that. So this is the reason we always use ballpoints when embroidering on a knit. And you might not think of certain things as knits, but like uh, fleece is knit, you know, the, the leather, the, leather yeah. is stretchy. And faux fur, yeah. faux fur uh, fabrics are knit. So, you know, the, the, that's one reason why the light ball point is so friendly to a wide variety of fabrics. But, Eileen, you know, you do a lot of quilting and a lot of embroidery mm -hmm. on woven fabrics. So, you know, the value of a sharp needle. Absolutely. So here you have a beautiful uh, images of the, these two fish uh, that, were stitched one with ballpoint and one with sharp, right? Right. And that top one was done with a sharp needle. It looks very pucker free, really a nice job on that really dense 
uh, nylon, tightly woven synthetic fabric. But on the bottom image, you can see slight puckering around that fish. And it's because that was embroidered with a, a light ballpoint needle. So, you know, let's be sure if you're going to embroider a a synthetic fabric like this that's woven and especially a dense one like a windbreaker or a rain jacket or something like that. So important to use that sharp needle. And, you know, uh, I know we have uh, uh, those, those uh, quilting cottons that love the sharp needles too, right, Eileen? Absolutely. And, you know, it's the, the quilting cotton. When you are quilting with your embroidery machine, like a long armor, you're going through three layers, right? The quilt top, the batting, and the backing. And ballpoint needles tend to enter the quilt top through the batting and pull the batting out the hole at the back of the, the backing of, of the quilt. And, you know, you may not see that right away, but over time, you, you sometimes get the batting fibers coming out the back of the quilt. And, ugh, I hate that because uh, often my quilt backs are dark and I always use wool, uh, wool batting. And so it only comes in one color but that I'm aware of. I only have one color. <laughs> and so, you know, that white batting can really be uh, glaring. So, and you don't want that. You definitely wanted to just slide through all layers and then exit just as easily as it entered. That's that's the real trick. And I do use the 8513 probably on all of my quilting because it is three layers. Now, if you are a long armor, you know, their needles are much bigger. They use like a 116. It, they're very heavy, but the speed of that machine is, at a, it, I think a minimum of 1500 stitches per minute. So it, it's a completely different animal and you, it's not apples and apples. So you can't compare our needles to long arm needles. It's, we have to do what's right for our machine, right, Deborah? Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, one of the, that's one of the reasons why uh, needle selection is so important. It's, you know, it's overlooked. In fact, it, it kind of tickles me that uh, one of our viewers had the compass and they've never noticed it had a needle recommendation, but the needles are so overlooked. I'm glad that we've got so many people chiming in today and, and, uh, and telling us what works for them. Right. And, you know, if you have any friends, you know, newbies or nov novices or even experienced embroiderers, you know, invite them, share this video with them so they can get these tips also. We want everybody's embroidery to be beautiful. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, uh, but you, Joanne Banco, she's a good point. She likes to say that the rounded points, the ball points poke through, but sharp needles pierce through. That's good. I like that terminology, right? Yeah, I think that is good. Very good. It's absolutely. Okay. So woven situations. <laughs> I like that. So, you know, we've already established that sharps make a cleaner penetration in woven materials, whereas the ballpoints spread the fibers in knitted fabrics, even in knits with elastic yarns like Lycra. And, and those have very you know, it's, as you can imagine, Lycra is a thicker yarn than uh, maybe a lot of others. So as Eileen just pointed out, the sharp needles have to penetrate three layers in a quilt sandwich. So these are special situations where you really do benefit from that sharp point needle, just kind of re reiterating that point yeah. you just made, Eileen. Good. Well, you know, Diana Mullins Atkinson, she said, this is an interesting question. Is needle selection affected by the machine speed as well? Well, I think only if it's an incorrect needle selection, you know, I mean, I think that if you are using an incorrect needle, you could, and you're stitching too fast, you could see poor yeah. stitch formation, skip stitches, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Absolutely. Right. And then Sandra Lee says, what do universal needles do? Oh, good one. Now, see, Sandra is digging in and thinking about this deeply, I can tell. Well, universal needles are what we would call an extra light point. They are even lighter than a light ball point. And so what they do is they let you kind of walk both sides of the street and use a the same needle kind of for a knit that, or for a, a sharp application because they are uh, 
not as rounded a point as a light ball point. So these needles are more widely used on the commercial side than they are uh, in the uh, home embroidery side because they just really don't exist in a true embroidery needle. Universal needles you see on the sewing side, right? So, so <coughs> sometimes let's say you were going to embroider a microtex uh, fabric or some kind of specialty fabric that was a very uh, unique and where it really would call for a uh, extra light ballpoint. In that situation, I feel it's okay, Sandra, to use a universal needle because it is a ultralight ballpoint. So, so it has a small, that smaller eye and it's got the narrower groove, but in that situation, I prefer to go with the proper point type uh, for that application. And, it, and you know, to the other viewers question, maybe I will go a little slower because we would be increasing the friction created by that narrower groove and the smaller eye. So offset that with a little slower uh, embroidery speed. I think you'll do, uh, you'll do okay on those really extreme situations. Right. You know, there's never any harm in slowing down your machine, right, Deborah? That's we tend true. to, you know, <laughs> go full bore all the time. But really, if you just back it off a little bit, you know, from 1,200 to 800 stitches per minute, you're not adding that much time to an embroidery design. And, you know, the machine, I think, kind of runs smoother <laughs> at a yes. medium yes. speed. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So Retha wants to know, when we say woven, do we mean cottons like quilting cottons? So, you know, there's woven fabrics and there's knit fabrics. And so do you want to speak on that, Deborah? You know, woven is two yarns literally woven together where right. these stretchy fabrics are knitted and it's one long thread. Really, right, yarn. Yarn. right. It's an interlocking structure more than a woven structure. And, and you know, if you want to think about it like this, okay, think of woven. Let's talk, let's name some woven fabrics, Eileen. Your sheets are woven, your mm -hmm. jeans are woven, uh, uh, your windbreakers woven, whereas your, your sweatshirts knitted, uh, your, your t shirts knitted, your golf mm -hmm. shirts knitted, you know, so that's kind of that's yeah. how I would illustrate it. And even those cottons, you know, today like the, there's so many women's garments that are cotton with some stretch in it well that, <laughs> now they're really a knit right deborah right and, yeah. and technically you're right eileen so you know mm -hmm. you could you could not go wrong using a, a a light ball point on on those fabrics absolutely right yeah okay and then um lisa, lisa schwartz says she does get confused with what size and what kind so the thing I can tell you is that that embroiderer's compass, boy, it, it's it's your reference guide to all things embroidery, needles, stabilizer, and fabric, and what to pair when. So, Deborah, you have that right there in your hand. I swear, I, I had one. Do. It's right here. It's just a wheel. Okay, it's just a so wheel. You've got the wheel. You just dial it to the fabric you're going to embroider, and the yeah. top window tells the stabilizer. But down here is the the whoops. Right here is the window that shows my needle recommendations. So it's a two sided tool. So there's uh, over uh, over 25 different fabric selections, and so you can get the needle recommendation for each of those fabrics with the with the compass it's a great it's, it's a, great a wonderful tool, tool. it really yeah. is we and do. then yeah judy whitaker she says so embroidering on a sweatshirt would you would use a ballpoint definitely absolutely t-shirts yes let's see okay so let's see what karen has to say here i'm interpreting what you are she's asking if she's getting mm -hmm. it the needles for specialty fabrics may not be embroidery needles, but the same needle is used on both the sewing and embroidery size. Size. In an extreme situation, that would be a really unusual situation. But but if you really felt that, you know, the fabric was delicate and it would really be one that you would sew with a microtex or a microfiber needle, then you could also embroider with that needle. But it would be a really rare situation because right. your, your result is going to always be better with a true embroidery needle. That's why they make them with that wider groove 
than the larger mm -hmm. eye. So, I mean, you could do it in an extreme uh, situation where you felt the point type was more important than the features of the embroidery needle, but that's going to be a very uh, rare instance. Um, and, you know, most of us wouldn't really run across that in our day-to-day -day embroidery. Okay. And then Linda Burke, she says that changing tension and speed intimidates her. She's afraid of messing with those settings on her machine. I can relate to that for sure, except the speed. Really, the speed doesn't mess with anything. It's just moving a little slower, you know, kind of like we all do as we <laughs> age, right? It's not that big of a deal. You don't even notice it, actually, until you're trying to keep up with someone who's 20 years younger than you. Um, let's see. Oh, so several people have said, what does the term microtex mean? Well, microtex, you know, I, I think some of you know what a microfiber uh, material is. It's it's a very uh, it's a very delicate uh, fabric because it's made with micro yarns, actually. So so in reality, uh, the the point of your needle uh, is is intended to work with those yarns. So, so in the case of a, a, a knit that was made with a really fine yarn, okay, that knit is going to be pushed aside uh, correctly by a very fine point needle. But, you know, when with the things we embroider typically, like a t-shirt, even with that fine of a yarn, an embroidery needle is the correct application. So I don't want everybody to go down a rabbit hole thinking about microtex be being yeah. good for embroidery. It's just that that point type is finer, but it's still a ballpoint. Yeah. Yes. So our fine ballpoint uh, works perfectly for embroidery on microtex fabrics on those. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Those. You know, there's no real reason to, to, to go there. I just, you know, I get a little too technical. I'm sorry when it comes to needles sometimes. And honestly, uh, the needle, uh, lineup that that we have developed, uh, here at dime covers all the bases. Absolutely. And so here, Lisa Schwartz wants to know, she's going to do an adult, an adult t-shirt for the very first time. That's a big oh, deal. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So what size and kind would you uh, suggest? Well, you know, we're not looking at the fabric. So, but Deborah, you go ahead and tell well, her. What you, you know, that's going to fall under that basic, uh, unless you're doing tiny text, I would say a 7511 uh, ballpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. That is definitely the way to go for sure. Okay, so let's take a look at what can happen to needles and like when you should change them, right? <laughs> well, you know, this is looks really scary, but it is what happens. It's called point attrition. It is what happens to your needle point after uh, after slamming it through that fabric. And of mm -hmm. course, the tougher the fabric, the faster this happens, right? So, so this is something that we don't see. You, this is magnified. You know, a, I don't know how many times. Many, many times. Yeah. Many, many times. So we can't see this with the naked mm -hmm. eye, and you really can't even feel it. Feel so it. you just have to understand that when you start seeing mm -hmm. sewing symptoms, embroidery symptoms like thread breaks, uh, mm -hmm. the easiest way to eliminate those sometimes is simply to change the needle. And, you know, we're fixing to show you on this next slide why you don't need to hesitate to do that because, you know, we're, we're looking at needles as something where when you start to see symptoms, like if one of the things rules we go by in the commercial embroidery world is after three thread breaks in succession on the same needle on a multi-needle machine, that needle gets tossed because you don't know how long a needle's been in the machine on a multi-needle machine, right? right. Whereas on our single needles, you can kind of keep up and you know, well, mm -hmm. I've sewn, you know, 75,000 stitches with this needle. I better change it. But mm -hmm. on a, uh, 
multi-needle, we change them usually after three thread breaks uh, in succession because uh, that means that needle probably looks like the one on the right, Eileen. <laughs> yeah, so let's kind of talk about that kind of best practices. So on my single needle machine at home, I uh, keep, well, here, let's get one out. I keep my, my butterfly of needles. This is how the dime needles come. There are 20 in a pack. And you can see here, it has the size and the EBBR and, and the ballpoint or light or, or sharp designation. So if you get 20 in a pack for $8, they're really, really reasonable. And I keep this right on the hood of my machine, you know, sitting up there next to the bobbin winder. And that tells me what needle is in the machine. And depending on how long I've been stitching with it, I may put it back in the case or I may just toss it. Now, sometimes on, a, on my multi-needle machine, because I don't, you know, I, I'm not a, um, a, a commercial embroiderer, so I don't have the best set of skills for operating my machine. But sometimes when my multi-needle machine's giving me a hard time, I literally change all 10 needles at one time. And I write in a book, needles changed all, you know, on, on this date. And I kind of keep track of it like that. How about you, Deborah? And I'm sure that's not the right way to do it. So tell me oh, how no, you do it. Absolutely. In a lot of commercial shops, it, they we do record, you know, and in fact, uh, uh, sometimes I've had schedules uh, just for changing all the needles. Absolutely, you're not you're not off base there at all. It's a good yeah. practice. But I'm just saying, generally speaking, uh, people don't keep up with that when they inserted that needle. So right. if you don't know, then assume that if your thread's breaking, the point's probably uh, gone on your needle. Right. And now Colleen has an interesting comment. Colleen Emmerich, she says, when I start to hear thumping, I know it's time to change the needle or rather be on time. And that slide that we showed with the needle, the blunt end, you can hear that. Maybe you can't see it and maybe you can't feel it, but you can normally hear that. Right, Deborah? Yes, and your machines. No, I love her comment because you can hear so many different things if you listen to your machine. You know, you can certainly uh, hear a bird's nest, Eileen, but you can also yeah. hear that thumping she's talking about when your needle is not performing. Absolutely, and Susan uh, Sardi, she likes to write it, uh, write the thread size. I mean the the needle size on the post-it and stick it to the machine. Yeah, I love that. That's a good yes. idea. Yeah. Um, and and Sue, Joanne Banco says, when in doubt, throw it out. My mother used to say that about food in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good rule. It was a very good rule. But hey, look who's here, Steve Jeffrey. Hey, nice to see you here, Steve. Thanks for joining us today. Many of you remember Steve Jeffrey as the president, former president of Baby Lock and a longtime friend of Dime for sure. So why don't we show them, let's go to the overhead cam so you can just see all the different sizes that we have available. So we have four sizes in both the light ballpoint and also the sharp needles. So, and each of these come with 20 of the needles in the pack. Now, Deborah, talk to us a little bit about those letters that are on there. So the EBBR and the SES, talk to us about that. Okay, so the SES, when you see SES on your rib pack, that means that's a light ballpoint needle. And that is the correct needle for your knit. So the, the and of course, the EBBR simply is the telling us that has the elongated eye. And so does the LE. Now, the EBBR, EBBR indicates it's completely compatible with your multi-needle threading system. So if you've got a multi-needle, these work in it too, just the same as in a single needle. Uh, and that LE just simply means long eye. And so what's cool about the dime needle line is that every single needle size is available in both sharps and ball points. Every, every one that's available in 65.9 is also available in uh, sharp as well as ball point. Very, very complete lineup there. And yeah. it's, it's easy to own all of the sizes you need, right, Eileen? 
Oh, absolutely, because they're very affordable. 20 uh, needles for $8, I think, is the special. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But I want you to notice that the label, so the solid label is the ballpoint, and the framed label is the sharp. So that makes for easy identification in your sewing room. And, of course, you're going to also see that uh, the SES or the lack of the SES on the sharp needles helps you designate what these needles are, you know, in your sewing room for sure. Now in retail locations, your, your dealer may very well have this display um, on, you know, right by their cash and wrap by the register and it has all these different sizes. And it also has a complete information sheet that you could um, you know, review in the store, even take a photo of that information with your uh, camera, with your phone so that you could have it in, in your sewing room. But, and of course that info is on our website too. But you, know, it's, you wanna have the right tools in your sewing room for sure. And if you don't have the right needle, my goodness, that's a very basic component of embroidery. So it's important to make sure you are all set up with the right supplies when you need them. That's what? right. And, and, you know, yeah. it's really been, it's really been great talking about needles. I could talk about needles for hours because they're such an important component of our embroidery and, and the, mm -hmm. and the quality and the longevity of it. So, so yeah. thanks for letting me uh, uh, talk about it for the, during this time. Oh, it's just always wonderful to have you here. Well, we're not going to let you go yet because Lisa <laughs> Schwartz wants to sew. Knits use the 65.9. Well, Knits use a ballpoint and the size of the blade would depend on the thread that you're using, right? So if you're using a 60 weight thread, very fine weight, like for micro text, then you would use the 65.9. But probably for normal t-shirts, regular embroidery designs, complex fill, that type of embroidery design, Deborah, it would be what the 7511 or... Absolutely, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you yeah. know, it's going to be, um, uh, you know, more, you know, the heavier the fabric or the heavier the thread, that's when you go above the 7511. Right. And Sheila Vetter is asking if we carry other types of needles. You know, Sheila, we're just all about embroidery here. So they're the types of needles we carry. We don't carry needles for um, cover stitch or overlocker machines. Sorry about that. And then um, Diane, what, I, Diane, Diana Mullins Atkinson wants to know what needle is best for making lace. And because she was taught to use a ballpoint and I know that she makes bridal veils. So she just wants to make sure she's using the right one. So well, I think I think for what you're doing, Diana, that the ballpoint is fine. It is a very it is a very uh, versatile needle. And I think it's fine for what you're making. You know, the sharp uh, because you're not penetrating fabric, uh, you're creating fabric, really. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, uh, I think that you could probably go either way. What do you think, Eileen? I, I think you could go either way also. I really, because really you're embroidering on stabilizer. I mean, that's right. really what you're embroidering on, you know? Right. right. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to walk back over in, in a moment, but to take a look at the, the labels, because there's some questions about that. But Esther Hoplin has an interesting uh, question. Does metallic thread wear out the needle? Well, it, 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 you know, in the old days, uh, I would say possibly back when we used rayon thread, it certainly, uh, that was a kinder, uh, gentler fiber than polyester. Uh, but, you know, polyester is pretty strong stuff too. So, I mean, metallic um, does have a synthetic core as well as the, um, the metallic covering. So it could be slightly more abrasive to a needle. Absolutely. I know that, that uh, some of you may think that you need, that's a good point too, to bring up. Uh, thanks for asking that question because some people are now buying a more expensive needle labeled as a metallic needle to work with their metallics. But we've got the, the good stuff, the King star metallic thread that, We'll stitch with the needles we're showing you here today, right, Eileen? Just any ring size, them any size yep. of those needles. In yes. fact, even that small one for micro lettering, the sixty-five nine, you can use our King Star thread um, on, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, there's a couple of questions people are asking about 
are our needles color coded actually on the, the stem itself? And they are not. So that's another brand that you're referring to. And we don't know anything about that brand. So we're going <laughs> to stick to what we're talking about here. So let's go back over so I can clarify. Um, first, on the box itself, you're going to see that it says the size and sharp or the size and light ballpoint. So it clearly uh, speaks out to you exactly what's inside. Now, the ballpoint labels are all solid, right? As where the sharps are framed. So they all have white with a color-coded um, frame around them. And then these these codes, uh, the color codes do for us internally and possibly you also as you get to know your needles. You know, the yellow is the 65.9, the blue is the 75.11, and the green 85.13, and the red is the 90.14. And I have these out of order. But um, so I think maybe that will clar clarify it for you. So let's see. And Diane, um, Diane Atkins Mullins Atkinson. I always struggle with all those, you know, three letters and three words in the name. Isn't that terrible? Um, she says she only uses King Star. Me too. Boy, that's the only metallic thread I ever use. And I have been working on some pretty exciting stuff that we're going to be showing you in September. And it has a ton of metallic thread on it. And I, I couldn't be more pleased because I haven't had one shredding event, one needle break. Wow, God is good when that happens, right, Deborah? Well, it's just the compatibility of, of the thread with the right needle, and we have both, so that's a good thing. And then one of our viewers wanted, to, she asked, is there a chart for needle and, and material? That was Karen Hook. So we have uh, Deborah's creation, which is the embroiderer's compass, and the compass has all of that information, needle, fabric, and stabilizer, and also specific hooping tips if it's a unique item, right, Deborah? Right, yeah, the, 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 the comments section on the very bottom of the compass, it, uh -huh. could be, uh, it could be hooping, it could be a finishing tip. It's just something that made me successful with that fabric, right? Okay, good, good deal. Okay, so let's show them the special because it is really very reasonable. $8 for a pack of 20. So, if you're like me, I want to make sure I have every needle size and type in my sewing room because I'm only going to have a problem at, you know, 10 o'clock at night and there's not going to be a store open. So it's a small investment in, in your hobby. And if you make sure you have all the correct sizes and types in your sewing room, you know, we invest an awful lot in our machines our stash of thread, our embroidery collection that we purchase, and the fabric and material that we're working on. So a needle is that last thing, literally, to penetrate the fabric. And you know, you wanna use the right tools. So make sure you stock up and have a you know, full supply on hand. 20 needles last a long time, right, Deborah? Oh, absolutely. And you know, I think the wonderful thing about this deal is that you're not having to pay 75 cents or a dollar per needle. So maybe right. you will change your needle uh, more, more often. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can split that butterfly, right? The, the pink little wings, we call them the wings like a butterfly and you can split them in half for many of you who like to go to retreats or what have you and stick one of those um, wings, you know, in your sewing bag so that you have fresh needles when you go to class for sure. Right. Right. Well, Deborah, you know, we like to always talk about the small town charms. We found one this week that was actually um, done in, on the January quilt shop, but I thought everybody would really like to see it. And so if you don't know about the small town charms, it's a program that we've been running all through 2021. And it started in January with the quilt shop. It comes in both five by seven and seven by 12. These designs are free to you and available on our website. So you can go download all of the months from January to July right now, or you could do it once a month and follow along, make your version say of February sweet shop, and then post it on social media with the hashtag dime sew along. So here was March with the dress shop. We have had a lot of fun with these shops, I can tell you. And Bloom's was in April, which was probably a little early, a month early, but who wanted to talk about rain in April, right, Deborah? Right. 
And then May, it was time to get outside. So we did an outdoor cafe, two stories. And yes, these are multi-hoopings. Most of these projects and all the instructions are included with your download. And the downloads also include multi-format. So you don't have to worry about converting it to your machine. The town hall was in June. And that also is two hoopings. And then last month was Scoops, home of the giant cone. And oh, we had a lot of fun with that one. Who doesn't like ice cream in July? Right, Deborah? These are so fun. And I mean, they the colors so and the fabrics that the that the followers are are doing with these are are so creative. I know. And, you know, our friend Sue Brown over at OML Embroidery host a sew along every Saturday after the release of the latest Small Town Charm. So I release it the last Thursday of the month. And then two days later, Sue does a free sew along on YouTube. And, oh, they have an awful lot of fun over there. And Sue is building her own town called Sueville, which is super fun. So this month we found... Um, Susan Tillman did a the quilt shop that we did in January, and she is using it as a serger cover, which I'm sure there's a baby yeah. lock under there, right, Steve oh, Jeffrey? <laughs> that is so cute. Isn't that adorable? She put a little a little puppy in the foreground, and she has her um, her her sandwich board there that says Shop Hop today. She really customized it. I love her awning fabric. Very well done. Just beautiful. So it's been so much fun to watch people's creativity and what they do all year with um, the small town charms. Next week, I can't believe it's here already, but next week I'm gonna reveal the August small town charm. And I have a brand new product to debut and show you. So super excited about that. It's about quilting, which you know is one of my faves. Well, you know, Eileen, with the solutions you've come up with already for, for quilting products, I can't wait to see what this one is. Yeah, well, I think everybody's really going to like it. It's very affordable. And, you know, it's just another time saver, which we all can benefit from. So, exactly. Deborah, thank you for joining me today. You truly are a lifesaver. And I right. just love having you here when you share your common sense knowledge applied to this technical craft that we all love. It was a ton of fun and I really enjoyed being here. So thanks. And, and it's really great to, I love the interaction with uh, what, what everyone uh, has shared with us as well. So it's really Absolutely. been fun. We all learn together. It's awesome. So thank you, Deborah and everyone. We'll see you here next week, one o'clock.